Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about um, native plants as an essential restoration component in the Potlatch River watershed. I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to turn the, well, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to touch anything. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Stephen. It's really exciting for me to be here today to, to talk to you about, about our efforts. Um, so before I want to tell you a little bit about the Lake Toss Soil and Water Conservation District, in case some of you aren't familiar with our um, agency. So we work with willing landowners to improve lands and to protect their, our resources. And we work with a variety of different landowners, and include, including private landowners, farmers and ranchers, we work with land managers um, with state and federal lands. Anyone basically who wants to work with us, we'll work with them. We are voluntary, do locally led conservation. So we are not regulatory. Um, so we, again, we work with people who wanna work with us. Makes my job a lot happier. <laughs> um, we do work within the Laytow County boundaries. However, we are not um, county, a county agency. We are led by a locally elected board of supervisors, and we are primarily grant funded. So we are a sub entity of state government, but we get a very small uh, a bit of funding from the state. And so when we need to do a project, we need to go out and find the money to do it. So my focus today is on riparian wetland um, restoration projects in the potlatch watershed. However, we do a lot more. Um, at the district, we work with landowners on soil health. We do Palouse Prairie restoration and rare plant recovery work and um, outreach and environmental education, just to name a few extra things. And all of these projects are really collaborative. We have a variety of partners that we work with and those uh, individuals and agencies and groups cover the, late, the local, state and federal range. And I wouldn't, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our field crew right away. Um, they are the reason that we can do as much work as we do throughout the county. We can be really innovative and um, it's just been a, a real joy to work with this fun group. And because of, of this crew, we can get a lot of work done, I guess is the point. We do have a pretty long field season for them, um, April through November, although this year they're gonna work through December. And um, they're just a really another really essential component. So I just want to give you a little bit of background to focus in on the location. So we're on in the Potlatch River watershed. That's within the Clearwater Subbasin, and um, the majority of the of the Potlatch watershed is within does lie within the Laytock County boundaries. It's a little over three hundred eighty thousand acres, and seventy eight percent of that is privately owned. Be good with the lighting. Can you guys see the slides? Okay, okay. So our focus is wild steelhead habitat. Steelhead are uh, on the endangered species list. They're listed as threatened. And due to that fact, we have a variety of funding sources available to us to fund these efforts. Um, the Potlatch River has a, the strongest component of wild steelhead within the Clearwater River lower main stem population. That's a mouthful. Basically, it just means that we have wild steelhead and they're important. We want to help uh, recover them. So, and the Potlatch River steelhead are also genetically distinct from the, from the other Clearwater groups. So, because steelhead are an ESA listed species, they have a recovery plan, and we look to that recovery plan for guidance on how to um, develop our restoration program so we can be strategic and get funding to do this work. So the, the recovery plan lists a variety of limiting factors that limit the steelhead productivity in the potlatch. And some of those include high water temperature, um, low flows, excessive sedimentation, a lack of habitat complexity, as well as migration barriers. And then listed underneath each of these, you'll see in red some of the recommended restoration strategies. And there are a number of additional rest, uh, strategies, but I wanted to focus in on the fact that we can um, uh, cover a lot of our bases by restoring wetlands and planting native plants um, to address these limiting factors. So another uh, threat to steelhead recovery is the impact and the changes we're seeing from climate change. 
Um, there is a correlation between habitat loss and climate stress. And so when we are doing our projects, we also want to consider climate change effects and how we can reconnect habitats to restore the natural processes so that we have they have a refuge, a species have a refuge from these extremes that we're seeing with climate change, including uh, te high temperatures and low flows. So this graph showcases the average daily discharge at the mouth of the potlatch. Um, so this in cubic feet per second. So if, I know it's pretty small, but if you can see this graph shows you the range from our, the from 2006 to 2022, we have a very flashy system. We have really high peaks, as many of you probably know are very familiar with this, but we have high peaks and really low lows. Um, but I'll draw your attention to the red line going across. And that is the high flow event from the 1950s and 60s. So you can see we've changed a lot since then. And the peak flows used to be at, um, around 8,000 CFS in the potlatch during that time frame, And now we regularly get above that. And in fact, we're up into the 18 to 20,000 CFS some years. So that's a pretty marked difference. And we can just you know, explain that for a variety, from a variety of reasons. Maybe you know, climate change is probably a part of it, but also land use changes. We've done a lot of um, work in the upper watershed that has changed the dynamics of the flows. So, and that will change things down in the mouth of the potlatch. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, this is what the potlatch looks like at the mouth near where that gauge was. Um, or is, and this is what the potlatch looks like at 15,000 CFS, just for your reference. And then a few months later, we can be down to a trickle. I think in 2021, the potlatch actually ran completely dry. That was a really dry year for us, but it regularly drops to below one CFS for at least a few weeks. So these are the conditions that we're trying to mitigate for, um, cause that's not good for fish. <laughs> Um, so there are three major goals that we focus in on to um, try to strategically implement these uh, this restoration and steelhead restoration program. So they include uh, restoring, or uh, excuse me, improving fish passage. We want to address, and then goal two is providing suitable habitat for steelhead spawning and or rearing, and that basically means addressing habitat complexity. Our uh, streams are a little too simple right now. We want to. Um, address that. Goal three is to address flows. So we have uh, better summer base flows and that will in turn affect those high stream temperatures. So focusing on these three goals, the Leyton District um, has conducted over 125 projects since 2004. And this just goes through 2020, but this is just a kind of a just general summary on the work we've done during this time period. We've been able to remove, um, and I say we meaning the royal we, <laughs> Uh, we've removed over uh, 30 migration barriers, which has reconnected about 37 stream miles in the potlatch, connected about 450 acres of floodplain, and we've treated about 28 stream miles. And throughout all of these project efforts to date, well, at least through 2020, we've planted almost 270,000 plants. I'm sure we're close to the 300,000 mark at this point. And we've applied tons of seed Literally, I really do mean that. Um, we, it's an essential part of our restoration strategy is the revegetation side. Um, so these, uh, these projects are distributed throughout the potlatch watershed. You might not be able to see the colors very well, but just show you how these projects are distributed. So the outline here is the potlatch watershed. Um, a lot of the projects are focused in kind of the Eastern portion of the drainage, because that's where most of the fish are and that's where we can get uh, funding to work. So just really quick, I want to give you an example of each of those goals we just talked about. Um, so for a passage barrier removal, one of the projects that was completed back in 2013 was the Dutch Flat Dam removal that was with the city of Troy and on the West Fork Little Bear Creek and it opened 14 stream miles to fish. Fishing Game did surveys, I think the year a year or two after the dam was removed and found steel had occupying right away. So um, they were ready to get up there. And another example of a project um, for goal two, which is for habitat complexity. This is an example um, from Corduroy Creek on the, on the East Fork 
potlatch sub watershed. You can see this is not a good situation. Uh, we needed some revegetation. And so now with our revegetation efforts, we have um, um, better shading, uh, less erosion, and we have a lot that leaf litter, future wood recruitment. We have the leaf litter dropping into the water and that creates food for bugs, which is in turn food for fish. So this is just one of our successful revegetation examples. The red circled tree is the same tree for your, for your reference. So I'm also good, I'm going to talk quite a bit more about restoration projects. And um, so this, the project you see here is one of Trisha's old projects. She's got her fingerprints all over these projects that I'll be presenting to you today. Um, so, so it was really kind of fun to, for her to get that award today. And I'm presenting on a lot of her work. So, um, so this is a two mile project, a large scale metal restoration project we did in the East Fork Potlatch River. And this is one way that we're going to be able to address flow. We don't have a faucet that we can turn on to address flow. We can't buy irrigation rights like they can in Southern Idaho to increase flow. So we um, have this as one of our strategies. It's a pretty intensive strategy, but to restore our meadows, our meadows can act like a sponge and help us to uh, store water up higher in the watershed for release later into the, into the summer. So that's our strategy for addressing flow. So um, this is a typical situation. This is supposed to say degraded meadow up here. I left that label off. So this is a pretty typical situation in the potlatch watershed. We have these straightened streams and they were straightened for a variety of reasons um, uh, due to old past railroad logging, um, agricultural uses, people wanted to straighten the creek and move it off to the side and so that they could use the, the meadow for hay or pasture. Um, so this happened a lot. And also the uh, trapping of beaver, you know, removing beaver from the system um, changed a lot of things in these upper watersheds as well. So the problem here is that um, it, we're, it's too deep, the creek is too deep, and that means the water table gets depressed. See the little sad face? Um, so the water level is too low. We don't get good hyperreic exchange, which means we're not getting good interaction between the um, between the floodplain water uh, water table and the creek itself. Uh, and another problem is because it's so deep, the flood is going to is staying in the channel and we really need that floodplain access. It's too fast. So the ener energy regimes, regimes are all messed up. The water is moving out too quickly. That's why we see those flashy flows at the mouth of the potlatch. And because of the, the sheer velocity um, and the lack of riparian vegetation, where these creeks are getting wider and deeper um, annually. So this is an example of what that might look like during a high flow event. This is an old picture from Corral Creek, which is a racetrack project site, another of Trish's great projects. And um, so you can see that the flows, this is a high flow event. The water's moving fast. And, um, but yet even at this high flow, it's not getting out of bank. We're not getting good floodplain access. So this is what a healthy meadow system might look like. And we can see that this is good, um, but what's, you know, what's makes this a better situation? And that's pretty complicated. I'm gonna walk through some of these words on the slide so we can kind of see why we want to address this and how it makes things better. Um, so this more sinuous channel is uh, provides slower flows and um, better riparian zones for vegetation. And that's gonna be more attractive to beavers. And beavers are our friends in these scenarios. Um, frequent inundation or flooding allows the sediment to drop out. That means we can aggrade the stream bed or raise the stream creek bottom up a little bit, and then also attenuate or knock off those high highs and the low lows for the flows. The flooding also increases um, uh, infiltration and percolation, so we get better groundwater recharge. And then that high water table provides those cool late season base flows. So we get uh, we can address temperature that way. So we have a happy face here. We've got a, our raised water table, so better groundwater interaction. And then that riparian zone is, is um, again, future wood recruitment. We've got the leaf debris 
better food, you know, it just addresses the whole food web. We've got better food for the bugs and the bugs can feed the fish and so on. So here we're back to the racetrack site and we see, um, you know, in the corner, you can see the picture we just, just looked at. And this is a picture taken post restoration. And so up in the middle of the picture, you can see that little fence and that's a, a ditch plug or basically an earthen dam, which is redirecting flow away from that straightened uh, ditch and putting the flow into a, the historic alignment, which is, has better sinuosity and we have better floodplain access that way. So this really displays that well. Um, and at this site, we really affected the flow regime. We had much um, fewer days that without flow. And um, so this is a good example of our meadow restoration. And obviously the floodplain access where we get big change. So following a meadow restoration project, we usually notice a pretty significant change um, in the plant community. And, and wherever we make a disturbance, we are revegetating it. But we also see some pretty significant passive restoration effects, which means in areas where we didn't so we didn't do anything, we're still seeing um, uh, good effects and changes to the plant community just by rehydrating the meadow. And so, um, so we'll see an expansion of some of those wet adapted species like the false hellebore, which is the tall plant you can see um, growing here, uh, also increases in camas and bistort. Um, sedges and rushes have seemed to increase quite a bit. And we're also seeing a decline in the non-native pasture grasses that might be there. We'll see an increase in the more wet adaptive, or wet adapted native grasses. So we see all kinds of changes in these meadows um, and it's been really cool. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to the Leita District website to the resources page. And we have a, a document that is a monitoring, a vegetation monitoring summary that'll tell you a little bit more about, about some of those responses we've been seeing. So some of those responses are pretty hard to quantify. These early spring species like camas and bistort, we just don't have enough time to get out and monitor to really quantify the changes we're seeing. Um, but when we're out on these sites um, frequently, we can really see the changes happening and, and the expansion of these, of these great wet adapted species like the camas. Um, also, since this is a native plant group, I thought you'd be interested in the, the Liebergs tausha. That is a, a little spring plant uh, wildflower that's present on our meadows. It's listed as vulnerable. But when we're out on our sites, it sure does not seem vulnerable. Once we've met, wet up a meadow, um, it's just really prolific and thick, and you couldn't count it <laughs> if you tried to. So that's pretty exciting. So how are we going to get more water? That's We have a few options available to us. And I mostly put this picture up to get some smiles, um, but it, it does make the point as well. Um, one way to restore processes and have a really positive impact on that hydrologic cycle is to make sites more favorable to beaver or to bring the beaver back in. And I am not going to go into our reintroduction um, program. Um, and in the past, we've been able to, to do that. But the main point is we need to make our sites more hospitable to beaver. They will move in on their own. And if we have willing landowners who are willing to accept them, they can come in and, and really do some of that site maintenance for us. Um, so that's important. And then in the absence of beavers, we have some strategies to emulate beavers ourselves. And that is to install structures like these human constructed uh, beaver dam analogs. And we use these structures in order to um, encourage the floodplain to get out of it or get the creek out of its banks and get some better floodplain access. These structures can slow flow and capture debris, eventually grading the stream bottom and bringing that bank, that, that creek bottom up a little bit higher. Um, if, occasionally, we'll find a friendly beaver who wants to help us out and build onto these. Um, I'm sure they also take some apart if they think we've done the wrong thing. Um, but so these are just these are just the types of structures that we can utilize. They also help us get uh, vegetation established to make sites more hospitable for the beavers to come in as well. So this diagram just shows the really complex relationship that beavers and fish 
have with all of these processes. Um, so just really quickly, um, just once once the beavers have moved in and built their dams, that affects the flow complexity. It affects the water levels and the groundwater exchange. And all of those things are good for fish. And then those uh, changes in those processes also impact the riparian plant community, which makes the sites more hospitable for beavers. So it's kind of a continuous cycle. So the focus of our restoration program is on using process-based restoration strategies. And so in utilizing native plants to promote bank stability and to, pre to prevent erosion. Uh, we also want to add vegetation. Again, I sound like a broken record, but we want to make the sites more hospitable and more attractive to beavers who will in turn build dams and raise the water table for us. So our, our strategy is process-based and this approach takes time to go from what we see here on the left the degraded nano to what we see on the right. And it's a very active approach that often requires heavy equipment and a fair amount of disturbance itself. And so we need to have a really good plan in place for our revegetation strategy in order to make sure we're not making a bigger mess of things. So um, we're, we're you know, making, creating some of these, these big disturbed zones in order to shift the trajectory that the site is currently on. Um, so a case study of one of our recent meadow restoration projects is on the Middle Fork of Big Bear Creek. This is con initial construction was completed in um, 2021. And if you can see the red circled tree, that's a big tamarack in the middle of the meadow. And the next few slides, you're going to see that red circle just to give you a reference for where we are in the meadow. <clears throat> So you can see this orange line, that was the active channel. Um, so this project was actually pretty big. I'm just showing the upper meadow section of just to get the, the point across. But so we have a straightened active channel, it's really wide and deep. And um, we want the flow to be in that blue squiggle into the more historic alignment. So again, another aerial view. The um, picture on the left is pre, construction. So you can see the water staying in the banks in that straightened active channel, but you can see that historic channel scar um, trying to fill up. And then uh, the picture, sorry, I'm getting turned around. Picture on the right <laughs> is post the first spring post construction. So we filled in, we had enough material to fill in the whole ditch in that upper meadow section and encourage the flow to go into that more historic alignment. So this is just another view of that. So above the flow arrow is pre-project, and I'm just trying to key you into the um, floodplain access. And so pre-project, very, very little floodplain access. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. And then the, the aerial view below the flow arrow is the spring following construction. So automat right away got just incredible amount of floodplain access. And so while we achieved a few of our goals, um, uh, the flow path was altered, we reconnected the floodplain, um, but we still have a lot of work to do by adding habitat complexity. That means adding more wood to the stream, adding riparian vegetation. We need more roughness and more plants um, in these areas still. So how do native plants fit into this process-based revegetation approach? So we have a pretty extensive uh, program um, and strategy for all of our projects, and particularly when we create a lot of disturbance and do just this a pretty significant work in these large scale meadow, meadow projects. So we use native plant materials to protect our new structures. We need them for stabilization uh, to prevent erosion. We also want uh, more native plants for future shade and to add habitat complexity for future wood recruitment, as well as for future beaver habitat. And some of these strategies include um, seeding, planting, we will salvage sod whenever possible and or use purchased sedge mats. We have a, a plan to really strategically place our plants 
and we make a, a long-term commitment to our landowners for at least three years to do the planting and then we like to go back even longer and make sure that um, the things are going well and that the site's on a resilient path. And I'm going to talk about each of these strategies a little bit more. So, um, so one of the first things we do following a a big construction project is um, where we disturb the ground as we apply native seed. And um, we do this to add diversity for weed control and also protect these new structures. So the picture on the left is a new ditch plug. And again, a ditch plug is something that we install into this old, you know, active ditch to help prevent flow recapture. We have the flow, we put it over in a historic alignment, but we still have this ditch. We don't always have enough material to fill in the whole thing. So instead of, in, in, when we can't do that, we use these ditch plugs, series of ditch plugs, which create some wetland cells, and, but they're still going to get flow and we're going to get, um, when we have this bare ground going into winter, that's a little bit scary because um, we need to protect these structures, especially the first year, they're the most vulnerable. So even in the middle of August, we um, would try to invent a or create a growing season. And one of the ways we can do that, we do that is by um, putting seed on the ground, covering that area with burlap, and then keeping it watered. And that really is working well. A couple of weeks later, we'll have a nice mat of, of grass, native grass is growing. And it really means a lot to have that roughness on top, as well as to have all those little roots protecting the soil. We'll use other protective strategies for these new um, structures as well, but that's getting some plant growth on there is really important the first year. So you can see a little pile of slash in the background. That's one of the other protective elements. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So we have uh, developed multiple seed mixes that we use in different situations. So this is all a part of our approach to getting the right um, plant or seed in the right place at the right time. That's really important. So the first mix we might use, uh, we've developed a channel mix, which is a custom mix with mostly wet adapted species. And we're gonna use this in a situation like in a new channel construction or in a swale where you're gonna have water for long periods of time. Um, and so these, these species are all more adapted to those types of conditions. And then, um, then that, another mix we would use is our wetland mix. And this is a kind of an in-between. It's got a mix of the, or on the continuum of wet to dry adaptive native grasses. This is gonna be used throughout the floodplain where we have a variety of conditions. Some parts of the floodplain are gonna be wet for a long time and others are gonna dry out more, more quickly. So if we have a nice diverse mix, then we'll, we'll be able to you know, fill all those niches. And we also, add a diverse mix of native forbs as they're available and as is appropriate. If we're doing a fall seeding, we can add a lot of native forbs to those to that wetland mix as well. And then we have a woodland mix. And so that's another custom mix that we use. It's um, uh, with mostly dry adapted native grasses, um, common in wooded areas. And this is a mix we would use on access roads and in areas that are adjacent to the floodplain. So, and now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our planting strategy. We do plant a number of containerized plants and cuttings. Um, also for stability and protection, we have a diverse mix of species that we can use. And we will also adjust these species as the site is adjusting. So just because, you know, the, it takes a while for um, sites to mature following the meta restoration. And so just, and every year is different. So we need to make sure we're going back year after year making sure we have the right plants again in the right place in the right places so we do plant in fall and spring for multiple years and in order because we do that we are able to look at what we've planted previously and pla replace mortalities and then we mulch and we irrigate to help also increase the survival potential and i'll talk a little bit more about those um, elements in a minute so this is a sample um, list of some of our more commonly used native trees and shrubs. Um, the list for native forbs, sedges and rushes and grasses is too, too big for me to put up here. Um, but if you're interested, you can definitely contact me. So we use a, a number of different species and, 
And because we do that, it gets kind of complicated to figure out where, how do we maximize their potential, making sure we want to put these plants in the right places, given their, their condition, the, given the conditions of the site. And so we have a diagram like this. Obviously, I don't expect everyone to know all the codes, although I think a lot, some, many of you do. Um, so we have species of sedges, you know, our willows. We know some of our sedges and willows like to have really wet feet and some of them don't like that. So we don't always get it right, but we try to make sure we get the plants in the right place. And then we can adjust since we're coming back season after season, once we see what those water levels are gonna be like and um, get, get more stabilization for the sites with our plantings. So we do add mulch to all of our native plantings, um, whether it be seeding or containerized plants. So we do this to help retain soil moisture as well as to reduce weed encroachment. It also helps um, to use this bark mulch to help reduce frost heaving for those fall planted species. And it does increase our survival potential for these plants. And then the straw mulch we use on our seed, seeded areas does help prevent seed predation as well from little critters. Now this is an extra cost both in materials and labor. However, it's a really essential component because we feel like we have a really high investment in the plant materials as well. And so adding this mulch um, is, is a good, good idea and it's really helpful. So I mentioned slash a little bit. Again, this is a very important segment um, that Susan and Trish figured out. <laughs> and we're able to get good plant material growing. We use the slash to help prote protect those new structures and prevent so much erosion. And that also helps provide safe sites for our plants and for our, for our seeds that are growing. Another plant is use, use of stick berms and willow gates. So that's basically just a row of stakes stuffed with slash. We also um, like to use uh, willows. We've developed the stick berm willow gate hybrid this year. So it's a little bit of both. We'll provide a living wall and provide habitat the road. Um, but they also just interrupt flow path, slow flow and capture debris and sediment. So anywhere where we see, oh, we don't want a channel forming here. This is a strategy we can use um, to arrest that. Another protective element is exposure fencing. So we've been using um, these little cattle panel T-post enclosures to keep, well, exposures, try to keep the browsers out, um, especially when we're planting cottonwoods and aspen, which are kind of like candy for the deer and the elk and the moose. And then in areas where we have a lot of livestock access, we'll also work with the landowner and the funding agencies to if when where we can uh, fence out the whole riparian area so we definitely need to protect the, our plantings in that way as well when we can um and then these uh we're always wanting to protect the existing plant community whenever we can um so we use heavy machinery in these meadows and that might seem counterintuitive at times um but sometimes it's necessary and so we'll use these ground protection mats in sensitive areas we can lay these down and then the heavy equipment can track over those and the equipment once the equipment's gone we lift them up um, and the vegetation is is in good shape so in areas where we do have to disturb the existing vegetation uh and assuming it's mostly native we'll attempt to salvage the sod whenever it's whenever possible and this is a great really really um, successful revegetation strategy we try to do this whenever whenever possible um, so the way we do this is that, you know, if we, when we have heavy equipment, we have an excavator and operator out there, they can, um, if we're having to regrade an area or create a new persuasion channel or a new channel, they can scoop up the top layer of that sod and place it in a prepared site, hopefully right there. Um, and in situations where we don't have a site ready for it to be placed, the operator can place that sod for us on a tarp. And then our field crew um, can place it down the road. 
But this is, again, it's just a very effective and efficient way to revegetate a site. So we try to do this whenever we can. Once the sod is laid down, we'll cover it up with some burlap. Burlap is our friend at the district, and we use it quite a bit. So we cover it with burlap, keeps it shaded through those hot, dry summer months, and we keep it watered so the, water, the burlap also stays wet and provides a little more cooling. And um, once our fall rains start, we'll remove the, remove the burlap, and the next spring, you can hardly tell we've done any work there. So um, this is a great example of that, one of the ditch plugs. Um, and I think that's Trisha's head back there in the uh, in the distance. So this is one uh, ditch plug that was built that summer. It was covered pretty immediately by this salvage saw. There was a lot of sedge in that stuff. And then the very next spring, this is what it looked like, this picture on the right. So that's a nice problem to have when we go out to our sites with people who say, well, what did you do? You know, you, it doesn't look like you did anything. And that's a huge compliment for us on the revegetation side. So if we don't have sod and we have a large you know, structure we need to protect, we can also purchase sedge mats. So this is basically a big sod roll, something like you would have in your put down in your yard, but it's sedges uh, planted into this kind of jute material and grown out for a couple of years. And then we'll buy it and roll it out and stake it down. And that's a great protective strategy as well for some of these new, um, new sites. We will overseed these with our native grass seed mix to get a little more diversity added in there as well. And those in that way, they, with that native grass seed, you can withstand a few more um, different conditions. So I mentioned, and, and I should say the sedge mats also get covered with burlap and watered <laughs> regularly through the summer. So speaking of watering, um, I've mentioned watering or irrigation a lot, and we do it whenever possible, um, but specifically because we're doing our construction work in, in the hot, dry summer months. So we need to get revegetation on the ground right away. We're also contending with the heat and the fact that we don't get much moisture in the summer. So I highly recommend working with a contractor as a water truck, if at all possible. Um, when we have a water truck available, it makes things much more efficient. Um, and they can get a lot more water on the ground than we can. However, we do a really good job without it. We have all these water shuttles that get filled up and our field crew um, uses pumps and miles of hose and gets the water to where we need it to go to, to protect and again, help to uh, make sure we have the best survival as possible of our new plantings. So I've talked, I'm almost done. I talked about quite a few different revegetation strategies. We also have another document on our resources page with this title. And um, you can look at that. It um, goes into a little bit more depth about the strategies we just talked about as well as a few others. Um, but it also gives you a little more justification for why we do use native plants, why we um, do our revegetation the way we do it. And believe it or not, this is a native plant friendly group, but we do sometimes have to justify our, justify our use of native plants or justify our planting timing. And so this document is going to help us do that. It's a living document. I think we'll keep innovating and keep adding to it. Um, but if you, if you're, if you have um, more, if you have an interest in learning more, this is a place to go. So we do are fortunate that we can um, utilize, we have some great seed vendors in order to allow us to do the restoration work the way we, we do it. Um, we're looking forward to working with Rose Creek Seed. They are taking over where Thorn Creek Native Seed Farm left is leaving off. So that'll be our source for native forbs. And we work with, closely with Fairwater Seed. They have helped us develop those custom mixes that I was talking about. I'm sure there's other seed vendors out there that I'm missing, but these are two that um, <clears throat> we work with regularly. And as you all know, we have some great local sources for native plants as well. Um, we're really fortunate again to, to have these resources so we can get our native trees and shrubs and cuttings and forbs and all sedges and grasses and all the, all the good things. Um, and we, I just, I have to give a shout out to the White Pine chapter um, for their annual native plant sale. That's also a huge benefit. And it's something that um, people in the community have really come to rely on and a great way to get native plant materials in the spring. 
So my take home messages for this group are that, you know, as you all know, native plants rock. Um, we are so lucky that we have such a diverse range to use and shared. Um, and then this next bullet is straight from a presentation that Trish has given many times. Um, it's really important that we do the revegetation the way we do it, um, especially following these big construction efforts, because they could be at risk of failure and we might not reach those functional goals. Um, so I have to give Susan and Trish credit for this next acronym. So when in doubt, we plant the heck out of it. And that's something that we still say to this day. And it's true. And we, we like to plant the heck out of it. But I have to give credit where credit's due. Um, that's the source. So, and then we want to revisit and adjust as needed to our sites. So I already brought up Trish. Um, and like I said, she has her fingerprints all over many of these projects. And fortunately, in her retirement, can continue to play an advisory role. But really appreciate um, all the time and effort she's put into teaching me how to do these, do this work. And Susan is here as well. And so that's a fun picture of the three of us putting our heads together at our Nora Creek project. Um, so I really value all that assistance. And that is all I have for you. So I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Slash spread out. And I'm, I'm thinking each of them, one of these slash, do you have these stats? Yeah, do we ever need slash donations? Yeah. The question is um, where do we get our slash? And one thing we like to say is whenever we do a big, large scale restoration project where we're going to need a lot of slash, we're very favorably looking at our landowners who have recently done a thinning project or we've been really lucky that you know if we're working with forest service and we are idl we can capitalize on some of the slash piles they might have next door where there's some sort of a thinning or a logging operation up the road log you know slash has great value to us does not to many other people so we there's usually piles but moving it around can get expensive you have to get a dump truck and move it so it's really nice when you can have slash on site if landowners have trees and they're willing to let us thin them a little bit we can we can use it that way but you know usually a landowner will say well i've got all these slash piles over there oh, i'm sure you won't use it all and um we always surprise everyone and we we it's very protective and it's something that very important so but i'll keep your plum trees in mind <laughs> yeah right so a lot of our creeks are in a In, um, over summer in, and then when the flows come back up, they can start to move around again. But so even if we're not able to get perennial flows back, we want to raise that water table so that we've got that interaction in the pool habitat and those pools can stay nice and cool for the for the fish to, to over summer that way. Mm -hmm. But in the at the mouth of the pot, I think they just they have to move around and they have to adapt. And I'm sure a lot of them don't make it. 